Imagine a magnet so powerful that it could theoretically lift an entire aircraft carrier two meters off the ground. That's how powerful the gigantic central magnet of the world's largest research reactor for nuclear fusion actually is. This magnet is a key element for ITER. Without it, there would be no plasma and no fusion. The last module has now been completed, a milestone for humanity's largest fusion project. But what exactly does this mean for the ITER construction site? What makes this magnet so special? And and how much does it really advance nuclear fusion? That's what we're talking about today and with that welcome to the German science guy. My name is Dr. Jakob Potron and in Germany we say Los geht's. ITER is the largest research reactor for testing nuclear fusion as a commercial form of energy and is located in southern France near the city of Action Provence. The reactor is based on the tokamak principle, which uses strong magnetic fields in a donut-shaped ring chamber to confine and stabilize extremely hot plasma. This prevents the plasma from touching the walls of the reactor, which is essential at temperatures of over 150 million degrees Celsius. No material in the world could withstand these temperatures and even if it could, the plasma would cool down too much. ITER aims to demonstrate that nuclear fusion can actually produce more thermal energy than is consumed in the reaction. This has not yet been achieved with such a tokamak. In short, fusion involves fusing light atomic nuclei, mostly hydrogen isotopes, into heavier nuclei, releasing enormous amounts of energy in the process. So the part that is now completed is the sixth and final module of the central superconducting solenoid magnet inside the reactor, which is essentially the heart of the facility. This is actually an important step towards completing the construction phase of ITER. Solenoids are essentially coiled pieces of wire that generate magnetic fields when electric current flows through them. So it's an electromagnet. In the case of ITER, the wires are mostly made of niobium tin or niobium titanium. Some of you may already be familiar with these materials from other videos of mine. These are materials that have superconducting properties. This means that when sufficiently cooled, they lose their electrical resistance completely. This is the only way to keep these extremely strong magnetic fields running continuously in the reactor. The module for ITER was built and tested in the US and is scheduled to be shipped to France in the summer. The fifth module is already on its way there and the remaining four are even already installed, so the heart of the reactor will soon be complete. And in case a module is damaged or something goes wrong, the US manufacturer General Atomics is even planning to build a seventh one just to be on the safe side. The central magnet in ITER can confidently be described as a machine of superlatives. Each of the six modules is approximately 2 meters high, weighs 110 tons and contains nearly 6 kilometers of niobium tin cable. The production of a single module takes up to two years. Once all parts are on site, they are stacked on top of each other and with all the attachments from the 18 meter high, over 4 meter wide and 1000 ton heavy heart of the reactor. This is equivalent to about two to three fully fueled and loaded Boeing 747s, one of the largest passenger aircrafts in existence. Once assembled with the 18 toroidal magnets, which are the large D-shaped magnets and the six poloidal magnets, which are ring-shaped and arranged horizontally around the torus, as well as rest of the material of the entire magnet system, the whole thing will weigh almost 3000 tons and it will contain over 100,000 kilometers of superconducting cables, enough to circle the equator more than twice. Well, and the entire reactor will weigh right around 23,000 tons. Under full load, a magnetic field of 13 Tesla is generated, one of the strongest in the world, about 280,000 times stronger than the Earth magnetic field. The manufacturer General Atomics from the USA says that this could be used to lift an entire aircraft carrier, about 2 meters. That sounds so incredible that we did the math. According to the manufacturer, the magnet will store 6.4 gigajoules of energy. In theory, this corresponds to the energy required to lift an object weighing around 326,000 tons, 2 meters, which is even heavier than an aircraft carrier. But this would only be possible if all the magnetic energy were converted into mechanical lifting power, and that is never realistic. So it's just an image to help put the amount of stored energy into perspective. 
by way of comparison, an MRI machine in a hospital can generate three Teslas. And in Japan, researchers generated a magnetic field of 1,200 Tesla for a fraction of a second in 2018, destroying their laboratory in the process, which was not too good. However, magnets like these are not suitable for fusion reactors because a continuous field is required. The magnets are cooled with liquid helium to approximately 4 Kelvin or minus 269 degrees Celsius. And just a few meters away from the super cold coils will be plasma heated to 150 million degrees. For the duration of the fusion process, which will last about 4 to 8 minutes, humans will create one of the most extreme temperature gradients in the universe. The mechanical forces acting on the support structures are enormous and mainly vertical. This is mainly because the magnetic fields of the individual modules are controlled individually and even work against each other at certain points in time. ITER engineers talk about forces twice as strong as the thrust of a space shuttle, around 60 mega newtons. The support structures affect prevent a space shuttle launch with millimeter precision. The whole structure must therefore be built to be correspondingly stable. Okay, now there's a good question. Why would you need such a strong magnet? There are essentially two reasons. Plasma consists of charged particles. This can be influenced by magnets, but it has to be generated first. The solenoid does this with short, powerful pulses. Once ignited, it acts like the primary coil of a transformer and induces a current of up to 15 million amps into the plasma. That alone heats the plasma up enormously. As mentioned, the six modules of the magnet discharge at different times. The goal is to achieve maximum flux variation in order to enable plasma pulses that are as long as possible. A tokamak is like a transformer. It induces current into the plasma by changing the magnetic field. And through this choreography of individual modules, the greatest possible change is achieved over the longest possible period of time. A single large magnet would not be able to induce so much current into the plasma for such a long time. But there's a second reason. The central magnet, together with the other coils, controls the stability of the plasma. The plasma is extremely sensitive and can collapse suddenly in response to minor fluctuations. The solenoid can react to this through its induction power and this also acts as a kind of control unit. In principle, it can therefore be said that the stronger the magnetic field, the higher the current and the more stable the plasma. So, all very impressive, but now let's get to the big hurdle of the videos. You know this part of my video where I always look at the critical points of an innovation and of course we also have to do this today. So what does this mean for the ITER construction set? The current official plan is for the construction phase, which has been underway since 2020, to be completed by 2033 with the closure of the outer shell, the cryostat. That means at least another eight years. After that, the first test with fusion reactions are to take place and in 2039 the first real operations with deuterium and tritium, the actual fuels will finally begin. The completion of the magnet modules is truly a milestone for the ITER project, but it's only one of many milestones. We are keeping our fingers crossed that everything will go according to schedule this time. And just a quick update, the six of the nine modules of the vacuum vessel, so the container where everything happens, has now been delivered. The large D-shaped coils will be placed around it, so there is some real progress to report at that moment. And at this point, we should mention another thing. Have you ever wondered why so many countries are collaborating on this research and construction? I mean, the central magnet is being built in the US, the D-shaped coils in Europe and Japan, and the cryostat in India. Logistically, this is extremely challenging, of course, but it actually has its origins way back in history, in 1985, to be precise. The whole project was founded as a peace initiative to bring formally competing, well, now competing again, countries together in joint large-scale scientific projects, just like the ISS. And Russia is also still on board and is supplying parts without which ITER would not be able to function. It is therefore deliberately decentralized in order to promote trust between nations and the exchange of knowledge. I think this is incredibly important, especially now. Of course, it may not always ensure speed, but we need bridges like this even more urgently than a nuclear fusion reactor, at least in my opinion. 
But now let's get back to the big hurdle. Okay, one point has already been raised many times, but it should be mentioned here once again. Neither ITER nor its successor model DEMO are designed to produce electricity on a large scale. ITER is expected to generate 500 megawatts of thermal power with only 50 megawatts for ignition, heating and maintaining the plasma, not to mention all the energy required to keep all the supporting systems running. And although DEMO is expected to have a significantly more positive energy balance, producing up to 2 gigawatts of thermal power and feeding up to 500 megawatts of net electrical power into the grid, it will still not be profitable for commercial power plant operation. This could be the case after 2050 at the earliest with demo successor the Prototype Power Station or for short Proto. There are already plans for this with an electrical output of up to 4.5 gigawatts and then also in a commercial style. For technical reasons, however, all these plants must also be significantly larger than ITER. Okay, so this is one point. The second point, just like nuclear power plants, fusion power plants are or would be suitable for base load supply because they are designed to produce large amounts of electricity in one place but cannot react quickly to changes. Neither of these is really compatible with the increasingly powerful renewables that we see all over the world, which are characterized by smaller decentralized feed-in sources. If good storage technology is added to this, the need for base load power plants could become increasingly unnecessarily. But the importance of fusion plants become clearer in a global context. Countries with rapidly growing economic activity currently rely primarily on coal-fired power plants for fast electricity availability. These have a lifespan of 40 years. If the predictions are correct, a switch to fusion technologies would therefore be attractive in terms of timing. Okay, let's get to point number four. It remains to be seen whether future reactors will operate according to the tokamak or the stellarator principle, and perhaps even with a completely different fuel, namely boron. One of the advantages of this fuel is that it produces significantly less radioactive waste. Finding out what is best suited for commercial operation is also a task for the coming years and decades. So you see, so many questions remain unanswered. So maybe you ask yourself, wouldn't it make more sense to invest the money in simpler renewable technologies? We keep hearing that it is not worth investing any more money in ITER. More than 20 billion euros have already been poured into ITER. It's a billion dollar white elephant, they say. Billion is right, but white elephant? That's perhaps too pessimistic. Let's put the 20 billion euro cost of ITER into perspective. For example, the ISS so far accumulated cost of around 100 billion euros. And one thing that is even stranger to me, Germany's subsidies for fossil fuels amount to up to 70 billion euros per year. So 20 billion is still a lot, but fusion research and development are very expensive. And this amount is spread across many countries and over a long period of time. Europe, for example, bears 45% of the cost, Germany around 20%, which is about 2 billion euros. This puts it at the lower end of the cost scale for large-scale construction projects in Germany. Okay, so I think this point is not too big. However, there's one final general issue that we have not yet addressed. Nuclear fusion is and remains a highly complex form of energy. Simply constructing a fusion reactor is not a cheap or easy undertaking. Less industrialized countries are unlikely to be able to build such a facility in their backyards. This could allow a few countries to secure an energy monopoly, which could lead to political instability worldwide. And even highly industrialized countries still face major technical problems today. Material damage caused by nutrients, tritium breeding, shortage of helium, beryllium or lithium, to name just a few for which there are currently no solutions. So what will happen now with this mega machine? ITER is a monumental international construction project with potential for the future. Construction is unlikely to be halted, but it will definitely take some time. The completion of the last module for the central and most important magnet is a great achievement, but it is only a milestone and does not mean that the end of the construction phase is closed. So we still have to wait for the first plasma, but it will almost certainly come. At the same time, planning for ITER's successor has already begun and the valuable insights gained from ITER are flowing directly into the development of the demonstration power plan, which will finally feed electricity into the grid. But whether it will be a tokamak or a stellarator, and whether it will be economically viable at all, remains completely open for the time being. Nuclear fusion still faces major political and technical hurdles, and there is no guarantee that it will play a major role alongside renewable energies. 
Incidentally, extremely powerful magnets such as the one that has now been completed are not only important for nuclear fusion, they also play a major role in many other areas of research. In medicine for example, they enable high precision brain diagnostics such as in MRIs. Superconducting magnets are also used in the LHC particle accelerator similar to those in ITER. They are even being researched for radiation protection in manned space missions. And superconducting technologies in the low and high temperature range open up enormous potential in almost all technical industries. So ITER will also give us a better understanding of how such magnets can be operated efficiently and permanently. And there's another quick update. Two new records have recently been broken in nuclear fusion. Wendelstein 7X in Greifswald in Germany has set a new record in the so-called triple production, in some respects even better than Tokamax. And laser fusion at the NIF in the US improved its record again in April to 8.6 megajoules with a laser power of 2.08 megajoule. So things remain exciting in fusion research. It's simply incredible what humans are capable of achieving with this technology. So now now we are eagerly awaiting the completion of ITER's reactor. I hope to be able to report on the start of the first scientific operations in 2034. Until then, see you next time in another video. Goodbye, your Jacob.